Welcome to chapter 13, Investing in Mutual Funds. Dear students, we have taken a look at bonds, we have looked at stocks, and we have found that in both cases it really isn't normal, it really isn't typical for us to actually go out and buy our own bonds and buy our own stocks. Some people will do it, some people will, and they may or may not find that they're very good at it. <laughs> but when it comes to items that are not easy to produce on your own, we normally go out and purchase them from someone else whose expertise is building a car or flying an airplane across the country or making shoes or if we need insurance we go to an insurance company and in this case we need investments let's go to an investment company because that's the legal term you will not hear that term you will hear mutual funds but legally they are investment companies another name that I hear sometimes is investments for the masses I don't know where I saw it maybe I made it up I'm not sure but that's that's what they are folks for the vast majority of us mutual funds make sense one uh, knock one complaint that people have about mutual funds is that they're boring well that's true but there's an industry saying that mutual funds will bore you to wealth assuming you exactly forget about them which is what we're gonna find is what we really should be doing so let's learn how to be bored to wealth slide number two what is a mutual fund well very simply it is a pool of money it's an investment chosen by people who pool their money and then the company the mutual fund buys the stocks bonds and other whatever other underlying investments the investment company is legally required to invest in because the company registered themselves as a regulated in investment company and there's a there's an entire um, act of Congress that was done back in, in 1940 that outlined the mutual fund industry and has served the industry very very well these many years and what we get from mutual funds I want you to memorize these two folks <laughs> are professional money management these people are supposed to know what they're doing they get paid very well for doing it some are very good some eh, not so good and we get instant diversification something that is very difficult for us as working grunts to get on our own every fund has a specific objective it will be uh, stock oriented or bond oriented or some other type of objective that is outlined in the prospectus and also in the accompanying uh, sales literature because very few people actually read the prospectus there are 11 th actually more than 11,000 funds to choose 11,000 different funds. what's going on here do you have 11,000 different types of breakfast cereal in the grocery store well it kind of seems like it but no it's nowhere near that are there 11,000 different types of cars on the road why are there 11,000 mutual funds well we'll see there's two um, uh, things that have produced the number of mutual funds one of them is plain and simple it's not hard to start a mutual fund you don't need a whole lot of them you need more than you know uh, enough more than more money than most of you and I would ever have to start this business but but in the in the uh, in the investment world it's not a whole lot of money to get one started and they are very profitable <laughs> they make a lot of money some don't but most do and and what has happened is the world has just gotten so more complex so much more complicated that there are just dozens of different types of mutual funds and and companies compete they all have to have one if one has one the other ones have to have it so the competition has driven the explosion of mutual funds 
And why are they so important to us? Well, because, as we'll see when we get to chapter 14, when we are planning for retirement, they simply make the most sense for the most number of people. Plus, they are what are offered to us, more often than not, in employer-sponsored plans, such as 401ks and 403bs and the like. Plus, they're also very useful in IRAs, traditional IRAs, it's called now, and Roth IRAs. So we're going to see this as we move along. Here is my tried and true graphic that I produced myself. I want you all to be very proud of me. I know, I know. I am not very artistically inclined, to say the least. But here you go, folks. We saw this before, didn't we? Here are we. Here we are. The little people. And more and more of them are women, because women are deciding that they're not going to wait around for the guy, the man of the house, to take charge. Because they saw what their, happened to their grandmother, their grand aunt. The goofball told her, don't worry, little lady, I'll take care of everything. And he sure did didn't save a dime and then died and left her penniless and so the younger women are going no no not me <laughs> and we give our fifty dollars a hundred dollars a month if we can afford it more congratulations if not that's good as long as we're young enough we have enough time as we've seen and we shall see and we give it to the people in the top hats those are the Wall Street they're not all on Wall Street by the way um, not all in New York, uh, the, the mutual fund managers. And luckily for us, more and more of them are women. Why do you say that, Payano? It's very simple. Women make better investors. It has already been shown statistically. It has been shown empirically, whatever word you want to use. Women make better investors. They Why? Now, I'll leave it to you to come up with reasoning for why you believe women make better investors but I believe it's just because they don't look at it as men often do and these are we're talking in blatant generalities folks but men often look at investing like a sports game they're gonna throw the Hail Mary pass they're gonna swing for the fences well you sports fans what happens when you swing for the fences you strike out an awful lot right and women, if we may use the baseball, continue to use the baseball analogy, they try to get singles and doubles. If it makes sense, great. And I don't even know if it's true, because no one has proven why all they have done is proven that they are. Women are better investors. Cool. And what they do is they create a pool of money that, in my case, looks like a potato, but no, really is a pool. And that is called the mutual fund, the investment company. And then these mutual fund managers, they don't buy just 10 stocks. They buy 200. And if they buy stocks, it's called a stock mutual fund. And if they buy 200 bonds or 150 or more, it's called a bond mutual fund. And if they buy those short-term cash, we put should put quotes around that cash, if they buy those short-term investments, it's called a money market mutual fund. But usually the mutual fund disappears and you just hear people call it a money market. So those are the big three. But there are dozens and dozens of combinations and permutations. And we begin to see the very first one called a balanced mutual fund, which invests both in stocks and bonds. And in our next presentation, we will spend the entire presentation just taking a look at some the major categories just some of the major categories of the types of stocks because there are literally dozens and dozens and dozens of different types of mutual funds slide number four why do investors purchase mutual funds and so I want you to memorize the first two folks I want you to memorize the first two because if somebody will ask you well remember you're the expert for your friends and family why would I buy a mutual fund? Well, it's very simple. In just a few statements, you say, look, it allows for we um, uh, individuals who are, you know, just working class, middle, uh, just, just trying to get through the day. It allows us to benefit from professional money management and diversification. Now, 
the diversification part usually is never a problem because mutual funds normally own hundreds or more than hundreds of uh, investments. So if one investment goes sour, the company is what for whatever reason falls apart, then it doesn't destroy our whole portfolio. The fund manager, the professional management, this is the important aspect of our choice. Who do you want to manage your money? Well, you have to be careful because like professional athletes or celebrities, there's an awful lot of hype around some of these uh, companies. And for me, that's dangerous. But then again, I don't really follow sports and I don't really follow celebrities. So I don't really appreciate that. But what we, we have found, now it's changing, it's changing, but many mutual fund companies would shuffle their managers like a deck of cards and uh, just go after the, the one who's hot. Well, that is anathema, anathema, I can't know how to say it, but that's not good. <laughs> In my humble opinion. Because it it um it encourages the mutual fund managers to think short term, which is not good, folks. You want to think long term. So you have to look for an experienced management team, in my humble opinion. The third item is, you don't have to remember this, but I love it. This is from the wealthy barber, David Chilton, one of my favorite writers, who said the PETA factor is low. The PETA factor? What is that? Pain in the... You got it! It's a wonderful saying. And I think about it often, especially now after delving into the world of real estate, I have a renewed appreciation for the low PETA factor of mutual funds. Once you have chosen the mutual funds that you're interested in, you've seen companies with a good track record, there's not a whole lot you can do, folks. There's not, there's not much for you to do, except keep funding it you know on a regular consistent basis don't panic when the market uh, falls which it will do from time to time don't get greedy when the market zooms which it'll do from time to time just remember that it is a marathon not a sprint if we are to use another sports analogy slide number five look at the growth of the industry before 1940 there were mutual funds but the mutual fund industry was very nebulous. Every state looked at these things and some of them didn't like what they saw. They saw the opportunity for a much hanky-panky. The uh, federal government didn't know what to do with these things in some cases. And what they saw, and we don't have to get into the details, but they saw a company operating on behalf of other investors. All right, but what's to keep that company from just pulling up stakes and disappearing. Exactly. Plus, how do they know how they're being charged? How do they know that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing and saying what they're supposed to be doing? Plus, how do you tax them? When a company makes money, the IRS says, ooh, damelo, give it to me. We want, we want you to pay us taxes. And the, and the mutual fund company said, no, 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 you don't understand. We're not making the money. We're making it on behalf of somebody else. Go tax the investors. And so there were many questions that needed to be answered. And why do I tell you this? Because in 1940, even though there were already 70 mutual funds out there, this, these questions had not been answered to everyone's satisfaction. And so the Republic rats and the demagogues, I'm sorry, Republicans and Democrats, got together and played nice in the sandbox and created the Investment Company Act of 1940 which to this day, dear students, regulates the mutual fund industry and has done a very good job. So I tell you that why, just to tell you that they can do it, folks. The, in the past has shown that the, the mutual fund companies can, I mean, sorry, the, not mutual fund companies, the, uh, the Congress, the, 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 part, the political parties can work together to do good things because the mutual fund industry is very cool. In my humble opinion, it's not perfect. Nothing is. But we have found, look at the growth. In 1970, 350. In 1980, 600. And then is when the world started to explode. 
between six between 1980 and 1990, 2000. The 1990s were a very big year for investments. 9,000, indeed, right? And then since then, the, the growth has slowed considerably. But still, every year there are a couple hundred extras. So we're up to 11,500 mutual funds. How are you ever going to choose? Wait, wait, relax, relax. We'll, we'll um, go through that. It's not easy. It is not easy. But it is now the largest financial intermediary. Huh? That means they hold more of other people's money than anybody else. They hold more money than the banks. They hold more money than the insurance companies. The mutual fund industry is indeed very large, very important uh, industry for people to help them uh, achieve their financial goals. Sounds Sounds like an advertisement. My apologies. Slide number six. How do you conduct transactions? Well, purchasing mutual funds originally was done through a broker. But then the investment company said, hey, go through us. Bypass the broker. So you can do either. You can go through a broker, brokerage account. You can have an online brokerage account and never talk to a broker and buy them. Or you can go directly to the investment company. Again, you could do it online. Never talk to somebody. They have representatives. Now, they don't want to give you investment advice. You understand? If you ask for investment advice, they're going to say, well, you have to talk to one of our licensed brokers. And some of them just don't offer it. They might say, well, you, you, know, you need to find a broker who can give you investment advice because we don't do it. And others will. Others will. Uh, some of them have their sister, Vanguard and Fidelity, both have a brokerage firm that is not the same as the mutual fund company. It's a sister company, but they'll refer you to them and then, you know, expect to pay for that advice. The best way, in my humble opinion, is through automatic contributions. You dollar cost average. Remember that word? Remember that phrase? 50 bucks, $100 a month more when you can afford it through your payroll, through your checking account. And then you just set it on autopilot and let it go. And you're not, not saying you're not going to review them. You have to review them every six months to a year. But uh, no, it's, that's it. That's why people call them boring. What about the sell options? How do, you, how do you sell? When you need the money, where do you go? Well, again, call your broker. Go online. Go call the mutual fund company. Go online. And the best way, in my humble opinion, again, is through automatic withdrawals. Into your checking account, set it up so that it happens automatically. So here's the deal. You ready? You ready? Listen carefully. You automatically invest $50 or $100 per month for 30 years, 40 years. Some of you millennials, 50, because you're going to be working into your 70s. And then you automatically withdraw 2000 3000 or more per month for the rest of your life. Are you sound? Are you interested? Mm -hmm. Sound interesting? Are you excited? I think you should be. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let's read the small print. Did I mention there are no guarantees? Hmm, exactly. Are mutual funds insured by the FDIC? No, indeed. You can, and there are times when you're going to lose money, especially if you want decent returns. But what we're going to see is that if you are prudent, if you think long term, ignore the, 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 the volatility, the times when the market crashes and everybody says run for the hills, and the world doesn't end. Remember the world? <laughs> That's another part. It really does have to stay together, this, this technologically based civilization. Uh, uh, then we should do okay. We should. No guarantees. But, but, as long as the world doesn't end, I'm confident that if you invest prudently, consistently, long term, you should do well. I'm trying. You know, so far, so good. Slide number seven. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. 
Well, yeah, you got to talk about it, folks. You got to talk about fees. Is the mutual fund industry a non-profit organization? No, no, no. No, they are a for-profit organization or organizations, for-profit entities. So you're being charged. Now, here is a here is an example, an example of where people know they're being charged. They know, come on, you're not doing it for free. But they really don't understand. And part of that is because of the prospectus that is given to them, which they don't understand how to read. And another part of it is that they really don't want to know. Sometimes you get this feeling they really don't want to know. So I do my best to explain it to people. And in the 121 class, we would have an entire chunk a big chunk of this presentation would be dedicated to fees and discussing fees and i not quite sure if i've totally given up but the questions that i would then ask on the exam would demonstrate to me that people did not understand a single word that i said they were all very polite but <laughs> then i would go okay i'm not getting through here so maybe we should just cut it back and, and leave it at a couple of slides so I apologize but that's what I'm doing this and we'll see we'll see you know I'll, I'll practice maybe I'll maybe I'll make an optional that's an idea I'll make an optional presentation that just shows you the different fees and the different I think let me write that down so I won't forget it I'm just thinking out loud here my apologies okay so what are, how are you being charged well all mutual funds all investments by the way have annual operating expenses they are charging you yearly based on a percentage of the fund's asset value. Well, if a mutual fund is run correctly, it is not an inexpensive enterprise. It costs money to go all around the world because companies are global now. And, and research, do the research necessary to make informed prudent and I keep using that word but I'm serious about that uh, it's any it's easy to go out and buy the next uh, Netflix and Apple and, and these companies that are exploding on the upside farce book and titter without doing the necessary research needed to know whether or not it's a you know decent long-term investment but there are thousands of companies folks thousands and and how would you know which ones are the best investments other than, you know, hearing what you hear on the news or radio? No, it's an expensive proposition. And so what they do is they charge you anywhere between one half to two percent of the value of your investment. Now, what does that mean? Well, say you have a hundred dollars in there. Point five percent translates into 50 cents. Some charge two percent or more which i think is way too high and personally uh which is two dollars for every hundred dollars you have in the account and they do that in perpetuity <laughs> which means every year some though have extremely low fees such as index funds and exchange traded funds and we'll have a couple of slides on those in the next presentation because their popularity is increasing uh greatly and there are reasons why, but they're not perfect. No investment is. And I think right now the the explosion of index funds and ETFs is ignoring the people who are involved in that. They're ignoring the downsides of these, and which is typical in the investment world. Some mutual funds have a commission that is associated with the fund. Sales load is what it's called, a sales commission, a sales charge. And this was the only way to buy mutual funds many years ago because they were only sold through brokers. It was originally used to compensate the financial representative who sold the fund to the investor. But that whole world has changed in many ways, which we'll hint at on the next slide. And in the chunk I described that I talked to you about, we went into great detail but not all funds charge a commission. Some, many are what we call no load. Those are funds that do not charge a commission. So you have load funds and no load funds. But you have to be careful. 
because some no-load funds do have low annual operating expenses, but some have very high fees and high annual operating expenses. So a load fund that charges a commission can wind up costing you less than a fund that doesn't charge a commission because you wind up spending more over time. That's all in the prospectus, which you didn't read. Slide number eight. We will spend just one slide doing what we used to spend, you know, 12 or 13 slides or more. I forget how many, but it was, I think it was about 13 or 14 slides where we would go, th we would go through these, these fees in detail. And I was not, I just, it wasn't working. So let's just uh, spend one slide on it. Traditionally, the only type of mutual funds were load funds. They charged a front end load. They were called Class A shares. They had lower annual operating expenses. An upfront fee. But people didn't like paying that upfront fee. And the industry does its best to make it easy for you to part with your money. And so they created back-end fees, Class B. By the way, some people call them Class 1 and Class 2, but most of the time they're called Class A and Class B, which have a back-end fee, but then they have higher annual operating expenses. And people would say, well, what difference does it make whether I have a, a front-end or a, a back-end? You're still going to charge me. No problem. Sit down. Relax. The back-end fee is a contingent deferred sales charge. Don't you just love that? I love that name, contingent deferred sales charge. It means that the first year will be 5% if you take it out, then 4 the next year, and then 3, 2, 1, until finally, after 5, 6 years, 4 years, everyone's, everyone has a different schedule. But after a certain amount of time, you don't pay any sales charge when you pull the money out. But they're getting you through higher annual operating expenses. So you wind up, in many cases, not if you have the money in there a long time, you wind up spending more with the Class B shares. Hmm. Then the brokers used to love these Class C shares because they called them no-load broker funds. That's what they called them. There was no upfront fee. There was no back-end fee. But they had higher annual fees in perpetuity which is a fancy way of spitting on your friend while you say forever. Or, or maybe so I've seen some 10 years. For 10 years, they have higher annual fees. Well, the Securities and Exchange Commission said, oh, look, you're just taking the, the sales charge and you're spreading it out over 10 years. So we're not going to allow you to call them no-load funds. They must be called load funds where the load is amortized, which is a fancy way of saying spread out over a certain number of years. All right, well, the broker said, all right, we'll, we'll take care of you. They then created the advisor no-load fees. Ha, 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 Securities and Exchange Commission. No upfront fee, no back-end fee, no higher fees every year for 10 years or so. But we're going to have enough for one or two for shut up. What? What did you say, Mr. Advisor, Ms. Advisor? We're going to charge an extra 1% to 2% every year to manage the account. These are the Class F shares, the Class I shares, or FI sometimes, Financial Investment Advisor, Investment Advisor, Financial Advisor. This is the modern day go-go way to soak, I'm sorry, to, to charge your clients. And I don't like it. Remember, I'm a broker. I don't have any clients that do this. They wind up spending more if they are long-term oriented than if they simply paid the upfront fee and got the lower annual operating expenses. But brokerage firms, brokers are moving to this model en masse. Why? It's got, in their humble opinion, it's got two great things. You're not charging them a load, so you can tell them, hey, we're not charging you a load. We're not charging you a sales commission. Plus, they make more money over the long term which is great for them. I don't think it's very good for the clients. And I will do my best to explain that to the clients. And uh, and as with the friend of mine who's an insurance agent who said, it's kind of like cigarettes, you know, you, you, they're going to hurt you, but if you want me to sell them to you, I will. I don't know that I would, because once I explain it to 
potential clients, they either say, well, I think you're right, Payano, and I'll go with you. Or they say, no, 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 I'm going to do it anyway. Say, fine, that's your decision. The last category, or what we put in quotes, are, are what the financial media calls true no-load funds. Now, there's no legal de definition for that. There's no legal definition for true no-load funds. But that's what the financial media will call them, true no-load funds. They may not have a 12B1 fee greater than 0.25%. What is what, huh? Forget about it. The 12B1 fees are those fees that allow the mutual funds to amortize, to spread out the sales commission over 6, 8, 10 years. And so the Securities and Exchange Commission said, ah, oh, look, these 12B1 fees, and again, that's a section of some code somewhere, so it doesn't mean anything to anybody other than people know what it is. And they said, look, you're, all you're doing is you're taking this, the upfront sales charge and spreading it out. So you cannot have a 12B1 fee that's greater than 0.25% to spread out the load. All right. But as we said on the previous slide, that doesn't mean that the overall fees are low. Because over time, a no-load fund can wind up costing you more in fees than a load fund. You must must, must look at the annual operating expenses and determine whether or not you believe they are in your best interest. Are you getting a good value out of your mutual fund? It's not an easy determination to make. Okay, so make sure you understand what's in this uh, presentation, these first eight slides. In our next presentation, I want you to... <laughs> Be ready, because it's like a sip from the fire hose, folks. We're going to go through the spectrum of risk versus return of mutual funds and find that it is very difficult to get your arms around the industry and choose a mutual fund, let alone a mutual fund category. <laughs> Choosing a mutual fund within the category is even harder. So you ready? It's not impossible, don't worry, but it is, it is uh, uncomfortable for many people. And I hope to uh, show you that you know, it, people deal with it and are successful. So we'll see you in our next presentation when we go through the full spectrum of the different types of mutual funds.